0.048 pectorals per kilogram. Her and her daughter measured 0.035 and 0.036 pectorals per kilogram, which is 18 times that of normal levels because they had evacuated. I think it makes sense that theirs were lower. And finally, a girl who evacuated with her mother from Fukushima, but who decided to return to Fukushima. When they measured her urine, it actually measured 100 times higher than the normal levels of 0.2 becquerels per kilogram. So we will so fundamentally, it should be their right to, to, to evacuate. It should also be their right to choose the same foods that to eat. And however, um, in March 2017, next year, they will be cutting um, housing subsidies so that people like um, Matsumoto-san, who are voluntary evacuees, simply because they were outside of the evacuation zone, which is set way too high to begin with. People like that who are barely you know, living like double lives with one, one house for their husband in Fukushima, one for the other evacuees, etc. They will be led into poverty if they start to just cut these subsidies. So these are what I wanted to come here to tell you about. I wanted to tell you that we definitely believe the importance in our right to live, our right to evacuate, and that the government is really not doing its part. Thank you. 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 Again, um, after the 311 earthquake, Japan declared its declaration of nuclear emergency and used that as an excuse to suddenly raise all sorts of um, maximum exposure limits from food, uh, playgrounds, everything.大原則に反するばかりか。最も恥ずかしいことは緊急時から平常時に戻ったとして避難指示の解除を出す時の基準として緊急時の基準を用いたこともしそうなら現実の福島は以前緊急時だって平常時ではないという So after the earthquake, they used that excuse to increase the exposure limit from uh, 1 to 20, for example, and various other maximum uh, limits. But this doesn't make sense. Uh, emergency measures should cannot just be changed once the emergency actually happens. You can't tell people, OK, this is what we'll do in, in the case of an emergency. Once it happens, completely change your mind, say it's actually OK up to here. And what is even worse is that the state has now taken that raised 
upper limit, and um, we base everything on that now. The emergency is ongoing, but it's pretending like it's back to normal and changing all sorts of other things based on that new upper arbitrary limit. その基準とは原発事故直後に緊急事態だからという理由で80倍引き上げた基準のままです。So what the government is now proposing is it's kind of similar to what you were mentioning earlier about the reuse recyclage of materials. And um, what it's proposing now is because during the emergency they decided that it's okay to multiply the, up, uh, the limit by 80 times, they're saying, okay, now we can use materials, soil, everything, that is 80 times more contaminated than what was allowed before the earthquake to be spread everywhere, all over Japan to share the poison. しかし、これは平常時を前提にした再利用のことだから、再利用の基準も自己前の80分の1に戻すべきだ。国の本音は中間貯蔵施設に保管される大量の放射能汚染度をなんとか処分したいからです。事故より80倍、80倍被爆する
this statement from the final law here. What is his name? So to answer the uh, to answer for the first question, the answer is yes. The contaminated stuff has been uh, uh, scattered all over the Japan and uh, uh, the burned out in the, some institutions. And for the second question, the answer is no. And uh, as long as they know, uh, there is no professor who has been okay. arrested for that. Thank you. Okay, well, what do you with, you've got this queued up? Because we wanted to return, they wanted to return to Japan with something, um, not just come and talk about what's going on in Fukushima. But we were hoping that I would especially get your advice to help us write a resolution so that we can try to know, get support. Yeah, get support, get signatures, like a petition kind of thing. So it's at the bottom. Bottom left, yeah. What is it kind of to other other Where is it? read it first. A little more. Can you see the whole thing? Yeah. I'll make it smaller. Okay, so uh, I will lead, speak, I will speak out loud. Uh, human rights declaration to save people's health, lives, and livelihoods from radioactive disasters. Voluntary members of the network to evacuate people from radioactivity, August 8, 2016. General statements. One, recognize the absolute need to decrease the post 311 maximum permissible annual dose of 20 mil seabelt back to one millisievelt, the minimum and unequivocal right of citizens affected by the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant disaster to evacuate based on this limit and to prescribe a domestic law to protect this right. Two, citizens worldwide recognize that the rights to evacuate based on the universal one millisievelt limit as a universal right to be ensured for all world citizens. Establish this in an international treaty and apply this to protect the rights of current and future generations of people who suffer from nuclear disasters. Three, measures taken by the perpetrators of this nuclear accident were one, to conceal information, two, increase various dosage limits, and three, understate the magnitude of the disaster, which consequently endangered the lives and health of a vast population of citizens exposed to radiation. This constitutes a crime against humanity as defined by international humanitarian law and should be punished by the International Court of Justice. Four, the, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster is the worst man-made disaster in Japanese history, as well as the worst outcome of a capitalistic economy for which the Japanese government has neither, uh, has neither the will nor the financial means to save. We must recognize that establishment of the solidarity economy and social economy formed by independent Mutual aid organizations is the only way to save victims suffering from illnesses and poverty. And then, and then this goes to specific statements. Okay. Uh, the Human Rights Declaration above supports that one, terminating housing subsi sub subsidies for voluntary evacuees by federal and local governments after March 2017 violates. Statements 1 and 2 of the Human Rights Declaration above and that the federal and local governments must therefore uh, retract this decision. Repeal, retract, repeal withdraw. or withdraw this decision. Withdraw. Okay. Withdraw. Okay. 
two, the Japanese government has the obligation to ensure evacuees' living standards appropriate for the above-mentioned rights of evacuation and should immediately fulfill its obligations. Okay. Do you have a copy that people can sign here? Okay, I'll go print it out. But before that, I just wanted to ask for any kind of feedback that would be appreciated because I don't think, I don't know if Kosho Asana has written it before, but I've never translated one. No one to just ask for any kind of feedback. Do you think it's valid enough? Robert suggested the word withdrawal be used. I have a number from before. There are, there are a few very small errors. If you just give me a piece of paper, I can correct them. Well, it's not very important at all. Yeah, I know. I'll just write it down. I would like to suggest that where you're recommending the one millisievert, that you do it in a way that it's less than one millisievert, but in no case more, because even that amount is really not an acceptable level, and you don't want to get people all signing on to saying it's illegal or that it's supported another high level. So I would rephrase the millisievert to a way. I think they're talking about the evacuation cutoffs. They're saying that if it's over one millisievert, people have the right to evacuate and with compensation. That's what it's about. Yeah, I'm saying that it should say one millisievert and possibly less. That's what I'm saying. It's in fives. It's like a maximum. Maximum, based on the limits. So we'll be able to sign on to this? Okay. At 4 o'clock, I think there's a general assembly, and I'm not sure what room that's in. It's in the Moss Building. In the Moss Building, Angela? The conversion assembly? But we're not ready to go to that yet. We still have an hour. We still have an hour. Are there any other questions for our friends from Japan? Way back, Mark? I have a question. Maybe you don't sign individual papers. Oh, yeah, email. We have an email. If I take an email, does anybody else want to sign this? Is that the most effective? Yeah, they have it. It would be nice if it would be electronic. And you get our email. Or could we, as a group, agree to sign on? Is that our individual? How do you sign on? Well, we all have organizations that we represent, so it would be good to have all of them. Gordon? I would just like to... There were four actions that the gentleman, the lawyer, our friend, I'm sorry, I can't say his name, but there were four actions that he brought forward the other day, and I just thought he could repeat what those four actions are. It's different from this. Excuse me. The four actions that this gentleman, the four actions, could he say what the four actions are? Yes, no, I didn't. Okay, never mind. If you don't... My mistake. Well, she's a way-behind interpreter. So that's... She's multitasking, so that's... She has to do something. There were four actions that were discussed earlier in the week. Could you... Could you bring that up?
Toronto. Oh, sorry. You have a Denmark T-shirt on this one. Yeah, that's the Denmark Federation of Labor gave it to me. Okay. Every year the uh, Labor Day Parade in Toronto, okay. the auto workers always right. sponsor them. Now Unifor. Are you in the auto workers? No, I used to be with OPSA at Ryerson University Film oh. Department. Yeah. Oh no, that's okay. Just going to pass those four actions out in, in hard print. Um, okay. Th thank you very much. Okay. Our next presenter is. Oh, we have. We have. We need to talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. 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 I could read them if you like. Um, if it's okay for the individuals to still sign, so you can take that home and then email it so the organizations can sign. Like, can we sign as individuals yeah, today and do both? That way, you have something to take home, like you said. Paper. Yeah. Okay. I'll go. And then, and then email still. Oh, do you want me to do that, maybe? So if you can interpret the instrument. Okay. All right. Gordon's going to read out. Are these the four actions, folks? Is that? Is this something different? Okay. We've got some more presenters. Uh, Gordon's going to read those four actions from our friends from Japan. And then we'll go to all. Anderson? Gordon? Our, our friends from Japan are coming to the World Social Forum to ask for support uh, for four actions. Um, and I'll just read uh, what is written here. The Fukushima nuclear accident is the worst human-made disaster in human history, as well as the worst possible outcome of a capitalist economy, leaving hundreds of thousands in Fukushima still suffering. But we are convinced another world is possible, which of course is the motto of the World Social Forum. And so, too, is another form of relief by taking the following four actions. One, the enactment of a Japanese version of the Chernobyl legislation. Two, adoption and ratification of an international human rights convention based on the Chernobyl legislation, basing our model on the Ottawa Treaty below. Three, pursuit of criminal responsibility, filing a joint international complaint on the crime against humanity against the Japanese government responsible for the nuclear accident. And four, reconstructing the lives of impoverished evacuees by establishing creative and mutually supportive independent citizens organizations to promote a social and solidarity economy. Uh, so uh, I think that we can arrange to have this put on the World Social Forum website, uh, maybe on the Nuclear Forum website, with the necessary background information about the Chernobyl legislation and the Ottawa Treaty that is mentioned here. And that way people could go to the Facebook page or the or the website page, Hoja, oh, which no, one would be better? No, Facebook. The Facebook page is the best. If you go to the Facebook page for the nuclear farm, uh, then you will find this these four actions with the necessary documents attached to it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Ole Henderson, uh, who's been keeping an eye on Chalk River and keeping us informed behind the scenes is going to come up and present. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief introduction. Uh, uh, and, you, and Gordon will give a brief introduction of his good friend, Ole. Yeah. Uh, Ole lives quite close to uh, the oldest nuclear establishment in Canada, which is called the Chalk River Nuclear Establishment. The establishment of this um, place was decided in Washington, D.C. in 1944 as a military decision as part of the World War II atomic bomb project. It was decided to build a nuclear reactor at Chalk River 
for the purpose of producing plutonium for bombs. And it was the outgrowth of research done here in Montreal at a secret laboratory into the best ways of producing plutonium. And it was that study that gave rise to the Canadian nuclear industry. But they have at Chalk River a very large and venerable uh, nuclear research establishment with many facilities with all kinds of nuclear waste of every description, solid, liquid, and so on. And O uh, lives close by and has a good, uh, could give a, a, a summary of what is going on there. Thank you all. Thank you, Gordon. And that's, that was an excellent introduction. As Gordon says, the history of, of Chalk River dates back to the Manhattan Project to produce nuclear weapons. And um, many activities have taken place, um, including the development of Canada's domestic uh, nuclear reactor program, which is based on heavy water reactors, reactors which have, have uh, deuterium heavy water, which, um, as was noted earlier, easily picks up an extra neutron becomes tritiated water, and tritium, as we know, is a, is, is a uh, hazard because of its mobility and its, the ease with which it is in, incorporated <laughs> as a radioactive form of water into our, our living tissues. And also, it has a 12 and a half year half life. Um, so, at Chalk River, um, the first major reactor was the NRX reactor, originally built in the late 1940s, and it had a significant meltdown in 1952. Probably, I guess that was the worst meltdown that had occurred to that uh, time in, in the history of nuclear power. Um, to the extent that the Canadian government was aware that uh, if the public heard about that accident, that the, the, the future of nuclear power would be in jeopardy. So the accident was concealed, the reactor vessel was, was taken, and a large hole was dug right on site, and the reactor vessel was buried with um, a lot of worker exposure in the process. And a new vessel was built in the same location, again, with more worker exposure because the surrounding concrete was also quite radioactive. So that's the NRX reactor. It was um, decommissioned about 10 years ago. There was a second reactor called the NRU reactor, which is well known because of its history in producing what are known as medical isotopes. Um, and most of us have heard about medical isotopes, but few people know that medical isotopes were at least initially largely produced in, at Chalk River in the NRU reactor with the feedstock being highly enriched bomb grade uranium-235, which was shipped from the United States from the Savannah River site up the Chalk River, left in the NRU reactor for a period of a week or two. And then uh, the, the molybdenum-99, one of the fission products from uranium decay, is, was extracted from that and then um, in the past 15 years has been then shipped to Ottawa for a profit-making company called Nord Nordion to send to hospitals um, around the world, and particularly in North America. So that NRU reactor, which was funded and subsidized by taxpayers, was doing the dirty business end of producing these medical isotopes for the profit-making company. And that's been a history of, of Chalk River, is that the Canadian taxpayers have poured uh, billions of dollars into this nuclear facility, and a lot of the profits from that facility have been then funneled into private sector profit-making companies. Uh, when the NRX melted down in 52, it, it left a great amount of, of contaminated uh, soils. The, the reactor vessel is still buried and water passes through that reactor vessel and, and cesium and strontium leach out of that um, and enter the Ottawa River, which is a tributary of the St. Lawrence and flows into, the, into Montreal. So there's a massive amount of what's called nuclear legacy liabilities, which are the responsibility of the, the government and taxpayers of Canada. So. It, 
um, recently, last year, to try to speed up the cleanup, in theory, of, of some of the radioactive legacies at Chalk River. The facility was, um, it's still owned by taxpayers, but now a consortium of private profit-making companies from the United States, Canada, and, and the United Kingdom are operating this facility. And their mandate in, is threefold. It's to uh, continue some science work, it's to clean up the liabilities, and it's to generate profits for, for these companies. Um, and one of the, the new developments in terms of generating profits is that um, uh, there has just been announced a proposal to, to make the largest commercial nuclear waste disposal facility probably in Canada and maybe in, in North America, right on that Chalk River site. Unfortunately, that site is within a few hundred meters of the Ottawa River on um, the Ottawa River itself is an ancient earthquake fault. It's still seismically active, and the rock there is, is, is fractured and, and porous. So um, this is not a brand new proposal. In, in past, um, there have been efforts to create large nuclear waste disposal facilities at Chalk River, but this is the latest attempt, and it's, it's going to be very hard to stop this, this new effort um, because of the amount of, of profits that could potentially be generated for these four companies, Atkins in, in the UK, C2HM, um, uh, uh, SNC-Lavalin, and um, uh, there's one other. Um, so um, this is now undergoing a federal environmental assessment, but very quietly and very quickly, it's, it's hoped that uh, a nuclear waste facility that would house as much as a million cubic meters of low-level waste can be constructed next to the Ottawa River at, at Chalk River. Um, initially, I had heard from the, the new uh, operating, the new management team that, that this facility would be mostly used for cleaning up the existing leaking waste like coming from the Barry NRX reactor vessel. But, but the latest we've heard, thanks to um, a tour that that's, I went on with some colleagues that some of you will know, Bernane Lloyd and Teresa McClenahan, we've learned that, that no, actually a lot of the leaking waste that are on there are, are hope that the, um, the new management team would simply like to declare those as in situ disposal areas and use the majority of the new facility for commercial, bringing in other waste from elsewhere. So this is going to, uh, I think, trigger some uh, significant level of opposition once the word gets out that, that this is really the main purpose. This is the largest amount of this new waste facility would be devoted not to cleaning up the, the problems at Chalk River, but to bringing in waste from elsewhere. And, and um, I, I was asking Angela about whether you've talked about the, uh, the Bruce, the, the um, DGR, the okay. Geological Repository. I think that's on your agenda for tomorrow. This site would be big enough to take all the waste um, that would have gone in the Bruce site. So if, as Teresa pointed out, potentially if the Bruce facility is, is, scrubbed. is scrubbed, then perhaps they would try to bring uh, at least a significant amount of the Ontario power generation waste up to Chalk River. That's a, that's a possibility now. Just the low level? just low but not intermediate level but what we found is that there's also a proposal for a cavern an intermediate level cavern much like the DGR at Bruce at Chalk River um, despite the fact that as I say the, the rocks are totally unsuitable and it's be, it would be a, a very close to the Ottawa River and would inevitably leak into the Ottawa River um, not one of the communities that's part of their consent based Process, no, 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 um, no. And and this was not be for high-level waste, but right. anything short of high-level 
the intermediate level waste would go into a, a cavern, the lower level waste would go into this million cubic meter, basically surface mound. Maybe you should uh, make it clear that this is a federal thing as opposed to a provincial thing, so that, like when we talk about the Lake Huron thing, it's provincial waste, whereas these are federal waste. And also, if you could just mention the terms of the Nuclear Legacy Liabilities Program and the price tag of the whole thing, maybe. Yeah, well, what the, the federal department, as, as, as Gordon says, this is, a, this is federal land, it's a federal facility. Um, uh, these are federal waste, but, the, but the, with the environmental assessment, there is no restriction to federal waste. They, no. they, there's the reference to commercial waste. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, the nuclear legacy liabilities um, program terminated two years ago when the um, switchover was made from a government-owned and government-operated facility to a government-owned and privately operated facility. So um, what was Atomic Energy of Canada Limited is now a very small organization, but that very small organization will is awarding the contract to these for private companies in a consortium to to make money out of operating the Chalk River site. So it's it's been turned into a profit making activity with huge amounts of of taxpayer money which have gone into it and which are continuing to go into it. And before it was cancelled it was like seven billion dollars? The 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 amount of liabilities that are on the books of the government of Canada, I think, are in the order of seven billion dollars. But the amount of funding that's gone to clean up those liabilities to date has maybe been two or three billion, I believe. Yeah. And hasn't the prime minister, the new prime minister, just announced an extra over and above the existing funding that goes to Chalk River, which is like eight hundred million or something? They've announced an additional billion, and is it yeah. to do with that waste dump? I think so. I am not, I, I have, I'm not familiar with that announcement. Thank you. Well, Dee's, Dee's got one question for Oli. Angela's going to come up right now and help Kevin get set up for the next presentation. Uh, this workshop is on nuclear waste, and Kevin's going to bring us home with waste. You, mm -hmm. And we're going to realize it's coming out of our ears. Dee has a comment or question for Oli. Uh, oh, let's make remember it. It is, um, Oh, Brene, who you mentioned, Brene Lloyd with North Watch, uh, who said she went on the tour here. I received um, an email from her indicating that there's now a comment period in Canada on the government choosing a level of nuclear waste below which they're not going to regulate. In other words, it's really bad to stick it in these leaking ditches and caverns. But on the other hand, what they want to do is take the stuff that's not so, it's not going to kill you right off and give you burns and treat it like it's not radioactive. Do you know the status of that? And we in the U.S. have fought it and it's not legal in the U.S. That's a, that's a different thing. Uh, what we're talking about there is free release limits. That means that you can, you can, below a certain level of radioactivity, which is measured in becquerels per kilogram or becquerels per liter, um, if it gets below a certain legally determined and therefore arbitrary, arbitrarily li labeled limit, that is regarded as non-radioactive and it can be dispersed into uh, landfills or it could presumably be recycled into commercial products or whatever. And, and, and that's, that's the, uh, the thing, the same situation exists in Europe and this is the thing that people have to be aware of worldwide is that the nuclear industry wants to get rid of as much of this waste as they can and in order to get rid of it one helpful thing would be if they could just simply dump it i think um, it's even more insidious than that they want to get rid of as much as they can but they want there also to be some de defined nuclear waste because there's so much money to be made in the nuclear waste disposal industry now. So they're not going to declassify all nuclear no, no, waste, no. but they're going to declassify the stuff that they can't make money from and keep a classification of nuclear waste for stuff that's more compacted or easy to access and transport. And this stuff is going to get shipped all over the world to facilities like Chalk River unless 
unless citizens speak up and say this is not the right way to go. Okay, we need to move on to Kevin. Can I ask one question, please? Um, okay, brief yeah. question. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Kevin Pierce. I'm the nuclear waste from the United States and other places to put in the sector. We are already importing uh, spent uh, uh, old tritium lights yes. from all over the United States. They go up the Chalk River and into the facility now. So yes, there's no restriction on, on waste okay. imports no, that I'm aware of. Okay. Thank you. okay, we're going to move on to Kevin Camps, who's with Beyond Nuclear. He is a nuclear waste specialist for Beyond Nuclear. And it's the gift that keeps on giving. Just let me know when I hand up. Uh, take it to the end. We're going to go right up to 3.30. We're going to go right to 3.30, which is about 15 minutes from now. And so then we'll take questions then for the whole. Um, and at 4 o'clock, there's a, a general assembly. So, Kevin? All right. So, forevermore is the key word here. I heard Keegan speak way back in 1993 in my hometown. He said, electricity is but the fleeting byproduct from atomic reactors. The actual product is forever deadly radioactive waste. And when we say forever, um, NEARS and some other environmental groups like Citizens Action Coalition of Indiana sued the Environmental Protection Agency in 2002 because the EPA wanted to cut off regulations at Yucca Mountain, Nevada, the proposed national high-level radioactive waste dump from the US. They wanted to cut off regulations at 10,000 years, and then it was anything goes. And we said, you can't do that. It's deadly for much longer than that. So we won that court case. and. Uh, the court ordered the EPA back to the drawing board. It took EPA four years to reconfigure its regulations at Yucca Mountain. And when they did that, they came back with a million year standard. So it's the first time the US federal government recognizes that this waste is deadly for a million years. It's actually much longer than that. But to get the EPA to admit that? So it is forevermore. And this is another allusion to a book title by Barlett and Steele from the mid 1980s. A really great book about nuclear waste in America. It'd be funny, except it's so serious. Some of the crazy stories. So for example, the WIP, Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in New Mexico. One of the stories they tell in here, it's, the, it's in New Mexico, it's in the southeast corner of the state. It's for plutonium contaminated military waste from the nuclear weapons complex. How did that start? How it started was the mayor of Carlsbad, who was formerly a used car salesman, <laughs> read an article in the newspaper, this is all related in this book, that the US federal government, the Atomic Energy Commission, wanted to find a dump for nuclear waste, and salt was the best place. Well, they had salt down there. They had salt formations. So that's how WIP came to be decades ago. And it has leaked since, so we'll show that. And I'll skip slides that I've already shown. But the thing about it is, we were talking about reactors in the previous session. Now we're talking about radioactive waste. All of these reactor sites are de facto permanent, long term anyway high level radioactive waste storage sites in the pools, in the dry casks. So that's not good because mega catastrophes could erupt from these pools. Uh, disastrous releases could erupt from these dry casks. So here's a typical high level radioactive waste storage pool. It's where the irradiated nuclear fuel coming out of the reactor core goes into a deep pool of water which provides thermal cooling and radiation shielding. And this shows some workers manipulating a uh, nuclear fuel assembly, a radiated nuclear fuel assembly. If that water were not in between them and that fuel, it would kill them almost instantly. But the water provides radiation shielding and uh, also thermally cools this hellishly hot and radioactive nuclear waste. And the industry in its propaganda will, will use images like this. Nuclear fuel, you know, a handful of nuclear fuel pellets could power a city for 10 years. Well, the thing is, this is fresh fuel. This is pre-reactor. If this person were holding irradiated nuclear fuel pellets or an irradiated nuclear fuel rod, they would be dead within seconds or minutes from the gamma radiation alone coming off, like x-rays. This gives you some idea of the pellet that goes into the rod that gets bundled into an assembly. You'll have a couple hundred of these assemblies in a reactor core. After a couple, three years of being in the core, the fissile uranium-235 is largely expended. It's called spent or used. Radioactive fission products and transuranics have built up in, in this fuel. 
cesium-137, strontium-90, plutonium-239, giving off deadly gamma for a millennia, at least, and then these long-lasting uh, alpha emitters that will last forever into the future. This is the International Atomic Energy Agency's warning symbol for radioactivity risks. And it is a nuclear promotional agency. But they kind of got it right on this one, I think. Get away. Get far away. Run for your life. Here are radioactivity risks depicted in a chart. Uh, a similar chart appeared in Rosalie Bertel's classic book, No Immediate Danger? Question mark. Uh, gamma radiation can blow through you. Um, alpha radiation can be stopped by your skin, but if you have a cut on your skin, it can get in. You can breathe it in. You can ingest it in food or water. Inside, in, in the lung, it will cause lung cancer. It may take years or decades, but it will cause lung cancer if you breathe it in. You need radiation shielding and distance between you and radioactive waste at all times, or you're in serious trouble. This shows where the different radioactive poisons go to in the human body. Another iconic image. Uh, Ole just mentioned the DGR, the Deep Geologic Repository, targeted at the Bruce Nuclear Generating Station in King Carden on the Lake Huron shoreline. This is an artist's depiction. The artist was paid by Ontario Power Generation. It's hard not to show Lake Huron when you show the DGR because it's so close by. It's less than a kilometer away, but they managed to not show it. It's just off the frame. And we call it the deep underground dump, which is dud in English, which means bad idea. So this is one of the many dumps we're fighting. Uh, they also have three communities near Bruce still in the running for the high level radioactive waste dump for all of Canada's irradiated nuclear fuel. That dud one is for low and intermediate just from 20 reactors in Ontario. DUD-2 or DUD-3, high-level radioactive waste from all of Canada, including from places like Gentil in Quebec and also Point La Pro in New Brunswick. Now, one of the problems with the pools, the risks, are fires that could happen if you lose the cooling water supply in the pools, whether suddenly as by a crack in the pool that drains the water away, or more slowly as by boiling away in an overheating incident. If you lose power to run the circulation pumps in the pool, in a matter of hours, in some cases, like at Fermi 2, the pool will begin to boil. It may take days, or it may even take a couple weeks for that pool to boil dry. But as we saw at Fukushima Daiichi, as we've learned very recently, pool number four, unit number four at Fukushima Daiichi came very, very close to having a fire. It only was averted by sheer accident, by sheer luck. A gate between the reactor cavity and the pool failed. Water from the reactor cavity flooded into the pool and prevented a fire. It was a complete accident. Otherwise, Prime Minister Naoto Khan's nightmare scenario of having to evacuate 35 million to 50 million people from Tokyo and Northeast Japan may have come true. And it was through sheer luck. And that's because the pools are not inside a radiological containment structure. Reactors are. Those can fail, as at 